Coming up on Tech News Today, is Facebook's mobile strategy a winner? Did China hack the New York Times? Why is Apple the biggest threat to Valve Steam? And some shocking breaking news about CES. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, January 31st, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell last year's gadgets. Find out what your used iPad, MacBook, iPhone, Galaxy S, and other smartphones are worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaka. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we bring you the top tech news of the day, put it in context for you, and start with the top stories of the day in the news fuse. The New York Times issued a report yesterday claiming they had been hacked over the course of several months by agents attempting to get into the email accounts of two employees involved in the coverage of China's Prime Minister Wen Jiabao's family. Security firm Mandiant traced the attacks to September 13th and stated the pattern was consistent with attacks attributed to the Chinese military in the past. China called the accusation irresponsible and groundless. Facebook's fourth quarter earnings are in and Wall Street likes it. Get it? Huh. Ah, good, good. good one, Adjusted Sarah. earnings per share were 17 cents, and revenue grew 40% from a year earlier to $1.59 billion. The all-important people number is good, too. 1.06 billion monthly active users, 618 million daily active users. That's up 25% since last year as well. And on mobile, Facebook grew monthly actives to 680 million people, an increase of 57% year over year. And here's an interesting statistic. Mobile daily active users users actually beat web daily active users for the first time. According to IDC, Apple's losing some ground in the tablet space. In Q4 of 2012, the iPad is still the top tablet in the world with 43.6% of the market. Last year at the same time, the iPad had over 50%. Samsung is a number two player with 15.1% of the market. IDC estimates that Amazon has shipped 6 million tablets in the quarter, which puts it in third place with 11.5%. Microsoft, the company that brought us some of the worst examples of non-standards compliance in web browsers back in the 1990s and 2000s, has had a change of heart. The company launched a new site called Modern.ie to promote the use of standard HTML5 and eliminate browser detection in favor of code that works on all browsers. Microsoft is also promoting feature detection. The move may have just a tad bit of selfishness here. Uh, IE10 is expected to suffer quite a bit from browser or detection, assuming things about it that are not true anymore. So how's that Surface RT tablet selling? According to iSupply, not that well. Shipments of the Surface RT were about 1.25 million, but sales were significantly lower, maybe on the order of 55 to 60% of that figure, says iSupply, with high return rates. iSupply also notes that similar percentages are common with, let's say, a new Android device as well. So this is not a problem just that Microsoft has, but in Microsoft's case, there may be a halt in production in this first quarter because it's trying to sell off inventory. Valve's Gabe Newell gave a talk at the University of Texas's LBJ School of Public Affairs. He said that the upcoming Steam Box's biggest competition isn't from dedicated game consoles, but it's from Apple. Newell says that Apple has a relatively obvious pathway towards entering the living room with their platform. Newell said that if no other PC platform will make the jump to the living room, Valve will be happy to. Reuters reports corporate records show Huawei had close ties to Hong Kong firm Skycom, which Reuters has also reported tried to sell embargo to HP equipment to Iran's top mobile carrier. Huawei's CFO Kathy Meng, daughter of Huawei's founder, Wang Zhengfei, and has served on the board of Skycom in the past from February 2008 to April 2009. Reuters found numerous financial and other links over the past decade between Huawei, Meng, and Skycom. 
Mega-search.me. Have you heard of it? Well, it's a new site that indexes files on Kim.com's brand new cloud storage site, mega.co.nz. Now, of course, Mega promises 50 gigabytes of free encrypted storage to users completely legally, but the new site, megasearch.me, lets users post links to files with the decryption key in the URL. If you click on the link, it takes you to Mega, where users can then download that file to their computers or Mega accounts. This is all relying entirely on users to crowdsource their goods. So, lawyers, start your engines. <laughs> subpoena. Beginning March 1st, Apple will cease selling the Mac Pro in Europe. Ah, is this a sign of the eventual foretold demise of the Mac Pro? Well, probably not. 9 to 5 Mac reports that new regulations on electronic sales in Europe go into place March 1st, and that's what's causing the cessation. Mac Pros that are already on shelves can continue to be sold, but no new shipments can be made. Tim Cook previously has promised new Mac Pros later in 2013, so it's possible Mac Pros could return to Europe later this year. Senators Kelly Ayotte and Dean Heller want to make sure that th that email and other Internet-only services remain tax-free forever. Those services are currently without tax, thanks to the 1998 Internet Tax-Free Act, but the act is set to expire in November of 2014. The two senators are proposing to extend it indefinitely. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Gazelle. Did you get a new iPhone or maybe a Samsung Galaxy S for the holidays? Maybe you're really good, got a new iPad or a MacBook. Before you give away or buy last year's gadget, uh, or before you give away last year's gadget, throw it in a drawer or something like that, find out what your gadget is worth at gazelle.com. The extra cash you get is the gift you give yourself. It's about time. Valentine's Day is coming up. Give yourself the gift of cash for Valentine's Day. Gazelle makes selling last year's gadgets fast and simple. Uh, I do it a lot, actually. It's just, it's just the easiest way I've found to properly dispose of old gadgets and get a little money for it. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Tell Gazelle the condition. They'll even buy broken iPhones and iPads. Get a risk-free offer for your gadgets. Lock it in for 30 days, giving you time to do whatever it is you need to do, whether you need to get a new phone or get the data off, whatever. Lock it in now because your gadget is not going to get more valuable over time. Gazelle has offers for Android phones, BlackBerry phones, iPads, other Apple products. Go take a look. It's trustworthy. Uh, and it is free shipping. In fact, they'll give you a box sometimes. Sell your last year's gadgets today at gazelle.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to discuss the stories of the day, happy to have Justin Robert Young from the Weird Things podcast as well as NSFW show right here on the Twit Network. How's it going, Jerry? Ah, uh, Tom, it's, it's great to be here, as always. I, I see that you are actually in Petaluma. I am. Uh, I, as is in Petaluma, uh, Sarah is in San Francisco today. <laughs> yes. That's correct. And, and I'm in Los Angeles, but we're all in California. Finally. We've, we've, we've been united like, like a constellation. We are dotted <laughs> across California. California Republic. <laughs> uh, so after that geography lesson, let's move on to Facebook earnings. Uh, like we said, uh, Facebook's mobile ad revenue uh, was, was very good. Uh, they, they made up 23% of its total ad revenue in Q4 from mobile. That's the thing everybody's really been paying attention to here, right? Everybody wants to know, is, is Facebook going to make the change to mobile easily? Uh, they got $1.59 billion in Q4 revenue, 17 cents per share earnings. That beat the street. Uh, and, and 680 million mobile active users, up 50% year over year, 57% year over year. First time they've had more mobile than desktop users. So how is the stock market reacting? Well, Facebook stock went down and it came back up. It's close to par. It's, it's, it's still a little bit saggy, if you uh, pardon the expression. And the reason <laughs> why is nobody's sure that Facebook can keep it up. It's not bad news, but city analyst Neil Doshi put it this way, with plans to invest heavily in the business in 2013, like plow a bunch of money into research development, and little expected contribution from new initiatives like gifts or graph search, we, talking meaning city, don't see any near-term catalysts for the stock. Uh, and some analysts are saying that mobile ads going up are just cannibalizing the desktop ads. So they're not actually making enough more money off of mobile. I'm not sure that's a big deal. Uh, however, Zuckerberg says, now we're there. We moved fast. We ship new versions of our apps on regular monthly schedules. The next thing we're going to do is build really good mobile-first experiences. And we're not going to build a phone. That's an exact quote. He said, 
we are not going to build a phone. So you just put those uh, so, uh, <laughs> those rumors to rest. Coming Q4 2013, Facebook, Facebook phone. Facebook phone. I, let's let's look at this though. A lot of people are saying, ah, well, all they did with their mobile strategy was actually make their mobile apps usable. They haven't done anything new. And Zuckerberg said, well, yeah, exactly. That's what we did. We made our mobile apps usable. Now we're going to make something new. Sarah, do you think they can they can get into this game and make things like Vine, like Path? They own Instagram. Is, is this going to help them continue to propel their mobile growth? Um, I, I think Facebook, Facebook has some really attractive mobile numbers right now, um, in, in, certainly in part because they have a lot of apps. I mean, I, I think about my experience, Facebook, you know, on, on, my, on my iPhone, I am accessing Facebook Messenger many times a day because that's how I'm talking to a lot of people. But there's no Facebook experience at all in that. But that's contributing to me being a daily active user. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think that Facebook knows that uh, there are a lot of people like me who aren't necessarily taking advantage of most of the service at all, but I like some of their products. And if they figure out how to monetize that, yeah, and they will, that's really smart. And yeah, I mean, buying something like Instagram, obviously it's, I mean, technically that's, that's you using Facebook now. So I, I think... I think the problem really is, I mean, I've become somebody who's not really looking at my newsfeed that often because again, I feel like I'm interacting with Facebook on a very limited basis. And I think that that, that does present a unique problem for Facebook down the road because they've got all these services, but people pick and choose. Justin, what do you think uh, as a user of Facebook, uh, we should be expecting from them in the coming year based on all of this besides a Facebook phone? Yes. Well, I mean, I think uh, obviously they are going to try to continue to create new and innovative ways to have you interact with their product. But what's interesting to me about these numbers is that the pessimism uh, I don't really get because initially with the stock, it was about, well, can they do this at all? It is, you know, do they have the ability to monetize mobile in a very meaningful way? And now that they are showing that they can and they can show growth, then that very, very core pessimism, which was really, really dragging down the stock with their high price to earning ratio, uh, seems to be dissipating. And that is a gigantic benefit to them. You know, now they can demonstrate that this isn't just, you know, once they sort of hit this peak number of users that are attractive to advertisers, that they are going to be on a decline. They, they seem to be showing that they have durability, and that's the core of the major doubts. I ask, is it, is it just financial concerns that are that are messing with Facebook stock? We, we as consumers, should should we care one way or another whether the stock is fluctuating a little around par? It looks looks like Facebook's in good position to continue to provide new and interesting services. Yes, I mean, Facebook stock's been fluctuating since it, since it, like, IPO. So it's not exactly unusual for that that's to happen. That's nickname, fluctuate. <laughs> exactly. That's the fluctuate books are the other name <laughs> that they call it around the streets. But the thing is, I think what we're going to keep seeing is we're going to keep seeing lots of different mobile apps, and we're going to see a lot more ads, <clears throat> excuse me, in mobile, because that's where they're growing the most. I would expect that the Facebook desktop experience, this this thing that was the default for the longest time, that's going to probably get a lot less changes, a lot less features as m more and more mobile apps are being built. Because at this point, you can replace so many different applications from your stock device, Android or iOS, with Facebook versions, Messenger, Camera, um, whatever else they have. There's yeah. just tons of these different things. Facebook poke, I as. I forgot about poke, excuse me. Yes. Thank you, Sarah, for bringing up poke. <laughs> for all those stock poking applications that are <laughs> cluttering up my home screen. But the fact is that's where they believe that growth is going to be because Facebook's been working on getting on even on feature phones at this point. That's where they're going to get eyeballs. That's where they can track data. And I think over the over long term, their biggest concern is how do you keep getting more of the world? You have like a billion users. Yeah. And there's a saturation point at some point where people are like, well, you can't possibly get everybody on earth, can you? Because this is, I mean, after all, it's a social networking site. And pa past a certain number, they are customers that are not as attracted to advertisers because you're dealing with areas of the world that don't have as high income as, you know, Europe and America and certain other places. Yeah, I, I think the fact that 1.056 billion active users, the majority of which are outside the United States, although half their revenue comes from the United States and Canada, uh, is probably the right place for Facebook to be. They're making a lot of money. 
uh, off the markets they've saturated, but they, they're growing in the markets they need to be growing in. And even if in some areas it is lower income, there's, there's still growth to be had there. So I think the prospects are probably pretty good for Facebook here. Let's move on to some IDC numbers that came out today, which are very important if you're a tablet fanboy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the, the numbers stand as follows. Apple is in first place with 43.6% of the market share. However, this is down from 46.4% the previous quarter. So not a huge drop, but a drop. Who's in second place? Why? It's Samsung, 15.1%. But here's what's interesting. That's a 263% year-on-year growth. So, wow. Amazon's in third place with 11.5%. Asus, uh, the maker of the Nexus 7, is at 5.8%. That's down from 7.8%, uh, even though apparently the Nexus 7, you know, sold really well. So says Google. Barnes & Noble is in fifth place with 1.9%. There's a gigaohm story uh, about these numbers that says, okay, we percentages, whatever. Apple's in first place. Others are catching up. That's all fine and good. But 52.5 million tablets shipped in the final quarter of 2012. If you compare that to PCs, 89.8 .8 million PCs shipped during the same quarter. Gigaohm says that's more, the tablets are more than half of what the PC numbers are. I mean, the, the, these numbers are, 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 are going to converge sooner than later. Um, tablet market grew 75.3% year over year. That's up from 29.9 million uh, in uh, 2011's fourth quarter. So huge growth. Increased 74.3% from the previous quarter's uh, total of 30.1 million units. I'm throwing out a bunch of numbers here, but this is, you know, it's the same song that, you know, I, I guess I keep singing that tablets and PCs are to many people more than ever kind of the same thing. I mean, a tablet, um, it, we, we've talked about this, you know, with, with Windows tablets earlier this week. It's 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 like a full computer. Um, you know, it doesn't have a keyboard and this and that. But for the first time, I think we're seeing the numbers of PCs in in a quarter, and obviously a strong quarter, a holiday quarter, and and tablets, you know, they're not that different. People are buying up tablets. Is, is anyone is anyone surprised by this? Is anyone surprised by who's in the top five, you know, besides the fact that, you know, Apple's still in first place? Well, you know, Sarah, I think not only are they the same thing, but if you're going to differentiate them for the majority of consumers, the tablet is a more functional PC for them, you know, because they want to be able to carry it around. They want to be able to interact with things in a, in a tactile manner, and they really only use the kind of things that tablets do very, very well, which is why we've seen those numbers. But I completely agree with you. Is anybody... Is anybody betting the PC horse at this point that that they think that this is not the the future of things that eventually we are just going to talk about PC sales as a group blanket number between tablets and desktops and laptops? And that's probably why Microsoft put such a heavy bet on Windows 8 being a t like a touch UI first. Yeah. Because what are they going to do with PCs at that point? Because PCs are being basically outsold by tablets. Those things are personal computers. That's the real yes. concept. Like this is your little device or larger device. They're incredibly intuitive that's the big difference between like okay what is this metaphor like a desktop i have a little trackpad okay that makes some sense but this idea of interacting directly with an experience you're used to with your phone and just yeah. making it larger i think a lot of people find that really comforting as opposed to going okay i don't know where's my task switcher what, what's going on it's a little simpler because you have less options in general when it comes to the way you interact with a tablet i think yeah. this is why windows 8 confuses a lot of people because you have two different environments I mean, these these definitions are going to sound like us talking about mimeograph machines in a year. Like we're just <laughs> we're not going to have these lines as tablets just become the dominant force of how people buy a mobile experience for their computers and how mobile experiences become more and more of your home experience. I do think that when you look at these numbers that they seem very familiar to me. If you followed the smartphone market share swing from the launch of the iPhone to the domination of Android, they generally followed this pattern iPad sales actually increased, but market share decreased. And that's been happening to the iPhone for a while. They continue to sell more and more iPhones, but with more and more Android phones and more and more smartphone users out there, they start to take less a percentage because they, they dominated a market that didn't exist until they started it especially with tablets, right? So it, it, this doesn't shock me. Uh, I don't think it's bad news for Apple, and I don't think it's a exceptionally good news for other tablet makers. I, I think what we're, what we're all talking about here is that the tablet market is still yet to reach maturity, 
Uh, yeah. And 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 that's why, you know, these definitions are flying around and, and, and whether we're going to continue to call them tablets or not, who knows? But but this is this is a market that's coming out of its its infancy. Uh, and, and I don't know, maybe it's a toddler. Maybe it's a <laughs> pre toddler tablets. Um, exactly. Yeah. We, we do have to protect the outlets. Ladies and gentlemen, so yeah. so go ahead and maybe set up one of those fences. Because <laughs> we need to near charge the these things. All the battery life's pretty good. Yeah, uh, but I mean, well, I mean, just just so the, the, with the Apple number, we can all agree that Apple doesn't care about the market share, though, right? They've never really Not cared so about. Much. They care about they care about continuing upward trend of sales. Yeah, and profits. I mean, that that's what they care about, and, and it's profits. shocking that it's still profits. this high. Uh, let's talk about these Chinese hackers. New York Times had a uh, lengthy report about an internal study that they did on their own networks. Uh, they believe they were attacked by hackers from China. Uh, the reporter covering Chinese Prime Minister Wen Jiabao's family had his email infiltrated. All New York Times employee passwords were stolen. Uh, sources for the story on the Wen family were not obtained, mostly because most of the sources were public records. Uh, but no customer data was stolen. No sources were revealed here. New York Times hired security firm Mandiant after they were alerted by AT&T that there was suspicious network activity. In fact, New York Times went to AT&T on October 24th and said, we, we think something weird is going on. Can you monitor this? The next day, when the first story was published, uh, AT&T said, yeah, we're seeing some weird stuff. Mandiant was brought in, found 45 different custom malware code instances. Uh, Symantec had identified one of these, but the other 44 had escaped detection. They, they just weren't normal virus code. The attack was traced back to beginning September 13th. The attackers had used university botnets, North Carolina, Arizona, Wisconsin, and New Mexico colleges, some other small companies, some ISPs, to access the network, to attack the network. They'd also used IP switching to obscure their source, and then probably got into the network with some spear phishing. They obscured their sources, sent some mails, got some people to click on some links, and were able to install some basic malware in the New York Times network. They then were able to grab a Windows network domain controller's user directory and password tables. They cracked those passwords, likely with rainbow tables, created custom programs to infiltrate the mail server, and then started searching email and docs. Now, when you look at this, you realize they could have done all kinds of havoc the New York Times network. They were in. They had they had control. They could have done a lot of damage. All they did was they targeted Shanghai bureau chief David Barboza, who wrote the story on the Wen family, and Jim Yardley, the Times South Asia bureau chief in India, who formerly had been the Beijing bureau chief, looking for evidence. New York Times says the back doors are all closed, botnets are blocked, passwords have now all been changed. This is this is not a continuing thing. Obviously, China says we had nothing to do with this. Mandiant says this is consistent with Chinese military. China says that's ridiculous. It's irresponsible to say that, to imply that. Uh, China is also a victim of hacking attacks. Chinese laws forbid hacking attacks. We hope relevant parties take a responsible attitude on this issue. All that said, there's, you know, the U.S. and Israel uh, accused of continually attacking Iran. Russia uh, accused of attacking Georgia. Uh, continual accusations that China is hacking. This hacking is going on, whether anybody wants to admit it or not. And it all hinges. This is the part I want to get to. It hinges on botnets and spear phishing. It hinges on us doing something. It's not that the systems are necessarily insecure. So what do we do to, to make people serious about security? Justin? Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's obviously people are hacking the planet. And uh, we are uh, the victims of it. I, mean, I, I don't know what we do to make people take security, like, security more seriously. I read stories like this, and they read to me like the stories in the middle and late 90s about the troubling culture uh, popping up around the drug poppy trade in Afghanistan. You know, before something major happened because of that, they were just these kind of niche stories to people who liked foreign affairs. These are stories that we focus on because we are tech focused. But, you know, are we really going to care about them until they start affecting major elements of our lives? I don't think so. I think that's when we take security seriously. And until then, it's just going to be like, oh, lol, the New York Times got hacked. The, I mean, the security thing is basically because people have administrative control over their machines. This is yeah. really what's going on. So you have to lock people out of things. So maybe this goes back to the tablet story, where you have limited options, where you can't mess up the operating system, where you can't have it permissions. Yeah. What needs to be done is these machines need to be locked down. I'm effectively saying people are too dumb for their own good sometimes. And you have to be the IT person and go, okay, you know what? You have this password. It only allows you to do this, or you roll back machines every night. It's really on the 
IT department to take care of this because they are really aware of what's going on. Maybe not the person who's, who's a reporter hitting like little links all the time, yeah. but somebody who's knowledgeable needs to be very aware that people can be can be tricked very easily. Sarah, is there is there any other perspective here? It's either we need a, a cyber Armageddon to shake us all out of our 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 feeling of uh, of apathy, or or possibly the IT departments just need to uh, assume that people are going to do stupid things and lock down the systems. Is there any other way? Uh, I mean, I. Does any company, you know, with a certain number of employees just need to have somebody on payroll that 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 understands this well enough to to make sure that that doesn't happen? I, I mean, you know, obviously at Twit, it's it's it, all the stuff is, you know, we, we do a lot of shaking our heads and, oh, gosh, you know, this when are people going to get serious about security? But there are a lot of people who, I mean, they never, ever think about this sort of thing until it's too late. So I'm not exactly sure what the solution is. I think... Um, educating folks about the dangers of, of 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 phishing attacks and that sort of thing is 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 certainly helpful. But we see in it in a in a story like this with the New York Times that it's it's very easy for people to to be duped into giving out information that 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 they shouldn't be giving out. I think we should educate our youth. We should have dare like programs in every school talking about strong passwords and two factor uh, identification and not clicking links. And not clicking links. You know we should we should be educating children are our future. I think zero glitch has it. IT approach should always be assume they have root, build from there, uh, and 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 lock down people's machines. I know it causes people to complain. Ah, I want to be able to do this, but there's so many ways to do virtual machines where you can have personal profiles and business profiles that are separate and secure. I think that's the way it has to move. Uh, watch Security Now or listen to Security Now with Steve Gibson if you want more on this type of thing. That's that's what that show is best at is is getting into these issues uh, and discussing them in in a way that you'll learn you'll learn tons by watching that show. Let's talk about Lyft. Uh, car sharing finally has uh, gotten around California regulations or, or gotten California to, to agree to some nicer regulations, I guess. Yeah, and 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 I thought that this was a great story for you, Tom, now that you're uh, an Angelino. Uh, last November, I, I had uh, talked about the fact that Lyft, along with other services that get around in Uber, um, was issued a cease and desist letter from the California Public Utility Commission, fined $20,000. Um, the the commission said you're operating, uh, you know, without a license for charter party businesses. Now, Lyft is one of these peer to peer ride sharing uh, services. So if I've got a car and I'm, I don't know, I don't have anything better to do, and I'm a Lyft driver, Tom can fire up his app and say, I want to go from point A to point B, and if I'm nearby, I give him a ride, and you know, I get a little bit of money, and and that's that's what Lyft provides. So Lyft said, hey, uh, CPUC. We're, you know, we're not, we're we're peer to peer ride sharing platform. We shouldn't even be regulated because we don't own the cars. We don't hire the drivers. We're just providing a service between two people. So in the meantime, right now there has been a agreement, an interim agreement signed between CPUC and Lyft that supports its legal right to operate while regulators are still discussing what's next in legislation. So this is not a, hey, Lyft, you're free and clear. This is a, we can't stop Lyft from operating or expanding while we figure out down the road wh what we're going to do with this service that, you know, didn't exist a year ago and doesn't really fall under the guidelines that are already drawn up for California. So Lyft is launching in Los Angeles starting uh, January 31st. So that's today. Lyft will be operating in uh, the LA area. It's actually starting in the West LA area. So kind of like everything West of the 405 uh, for anybody who's familiar with the area. So it's not widespread because obviously Los Angeles is a huge, huge area, but it's 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 rolling out. Uh, one of the co-founders is actually from Los Angeles and said, you know, this is really near and dear to my heart because that's a place where something like more carpooling and being more efficient with cars is desperately needed. Um, and I think, I think it's, it's really sort of fascinating. Uh, uh, for anybody who doesn't live in San Francisco, you've never been able to use Lyft because Lyft only works in San Francisco. Um, but it is really popular. In fact, you always know when you see Lyft cars because they have these big pink mustaches that they put on, you know, their grill and, it, it, for, for somebody out of town that, you know, it's always funny when you go, oh, you're not from around here. Because they go, well, look at that car with the pink mustache. And we're like, yeah, that's Lyft. That's, don't you know anything about Lyft? But in Los Angeles, I mean, the market is so different. 
Tom, do you think, you haven't lived in LA that long, but obviously you, you're, you're probably becoming familiar with how bad the traffic can be. Is this an even better place for something like Lyft where you've got people who are stuck on the freeway? You know, it's not so much, I, th I think in San Francisco, uh, it's more an issue of, well, some people just don't have cars. In Los Angeles, everybody has a car. So... I don't know. I mean, do, you, do you think... Uh, I'm not think sure this makes sense in Los Angeles where everyone has a car. You don't need to share your car. Who are you going to share it with? I mean, granted, Ed, not everybody has a car, but it's not the same situation as a New York or a San Francisco. It's like, I just need a car sometimes and I don't want to sign up for one of those zip car type things. So this is great. Uh, I mean, there's too many cars on the road already. So I... Well, but but, I don't know. but but it is a tourist destination. You know, there are there are people that are there in Los Angeles that are visiting sure. that need an option to get from point A to point B. And in San Francisco, that's fairly easy with public transportation. In LA, uh, it's a way bigger hassle. And I hear rumors that predators get down there on the subway sometimes, and it's a real issue. So, uh, what is interesting about these services like Uber and Lyft is that you are seeing a very clear case of innovation and consumers wanting this service while government that uh, has regulations for a bygone era of how to service and regulate cab companies and the cab companies and limo companies that are trying desperately to keep services like this off the street uh, are, are kind of converging and you're seeing, uh, to me, forward progress in the consumers and the better service winning. And I'm very excited that Lyft is in LA and I hope that you know that the march continues for all of these services not only in California but also in DC and New York City and in all these major markets where these become the norms and the concept of how we get cabs now is a way of the past. Yes, yeah, so and I should I should mention because uh, I didn't already is that you know people who say but there are cabs in Los Angeles it's kind of they're kind of expensive that's the whole thing is these are cheaper alternatives to the infrastructure that already exists. When services like Lyft come into places like Los Angeles where you need to have a car, it might actually make uh, future generations think, hey, wait a minute, I might not need to have a car. I can do ride shares, I can do Lyft, I can do lots of different options because this idea that everybody has a car individually and everybody is stuck in one of these things means that every, there's nobody's carpooling. So you have yeah. all this traffic. So if this could have longer term effects to reduce congestion in some place like Los Angeles, which I've been in, this should... This would be a great thing if it, services like this expand, and not just Lyft, but a lot more co competitors show up. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Behavior change would make this work really well in a play, in a driver culture city like Houston or like like LA. Uh, behavior change is always hard to get, though. Let's talk about uh, Gabe Newell from Valve saying that Steam has a big threat out there, but it's not the Xbox, it's not the PS3. What is it, Ayaz? He's talking about Apple. Apparently the Steam box or any other PC trying to get into the living room, Newell thinks is going to face tough competition from Apple. He says, I think there's a scenario where we, we, we sort of see a dumbed-down living room platform emerging. I think Apple rolls the console guys really easily. He says if PC platforms want to get into the living room, they have to sell the strengths of the hardware like customizable form factors and increased hard drive space. And he said that if no one's willing to do that, Valve, Valve will. Justin, traditional computer makers have wowed people with specs. It's like, hey, look, we got, we got this kind of shape or we have this hard drive, this gigahertz, whatever it is. Does that really matter as much when it comes to the living room? Well, I, I think going forward, not necessarily. We've seen the biggest explosion in gaming has been mobile. It's been ease of use and it's been cheap product that you know the way that our relationship with games has evolved further and further away from i want to pay a larger price to have a longer experience you still see that and there is a niche for that that is exploding but it's not the way it's not where new gamers are coming from they're coming from very uh you know casual games so if you have an easy way to get an experience like that on a larger screen in your living room i think there's no reason to think that that wouldn't be a, a huge successful place where it's funny. I saw somebody in, in, in the chat room make mention that, you know, like, well, yeah, because when I think of Apple or when I think of Macs, I think of gaming. And it's like, well, not in the desktop, but when you think of iOS, you think of gaming. When you think of your iPad, your iPhone, you certainly think of gaming. Tom, PCs have been trying to get into the living room for a very long time. They've been hampered by stability issues. Do you think that they can finally get into the living room with something like the Steam Box with its 10-foot uh, interface? 
Well, I think that's the point of the Steam Box is it's saying PCs don't go in the living room. Consoles go in the living room. So Steam's making a console. Now you can argue semantics about, well, it's essentially a PC in a different case. Uh, but that that's what we've been waiting for, is a PC in a, in a, in a home theater-friendly case. That's what the Xbox was when it first launched. Remember, everybody was like, these parts are PC parts in here. So this is really smart on Steam's part. I think they're right that Steam appeals to a different user space. In fact, I think it's a user space that Nintendo just boofed. Uh, with the Wii U. By all accounts, people are more excited still about the Wii than they are about the Wii U, even though there's there's Nintendo Wii U lovers there and there's nothing wrong with that system. It's just not catching on. So that casual gaming living room area ha is a little soft right now. There's, there's a possibility for somebody like Apple to come in and steal a lot of thunder. And how much room does that leave for Steam? Steam appeals to hardcore gamers, though. So I, I can't see that... Apple really steals all of Steam's thunder. But, it, but I get what Gabe Newell's talking about, is there, there's a space in there that Steam could fit in. And if Apple got its act together and put a, a set-top box like an Apple TV on steroids that included a significant gaming platform, that could be trouble. I think, I think Valve's strongest suit are PCs in general. If they could just flat out say, look, any games you already have will still play. Any media you already have, it doesn't matter what it is, it'll play because as long as your computer can do it, so can this machine. Because when you go down to one of these little set-top boxes or a console, you kind of get locked into, what do you support? Do you just support MP4s? Do you support this file format or that file format? If somehow the PC interface can be stable enough on a, on a, on a television, that's really where I think the problem has been. I mean, Xbox, like Tom said, it was a hidden PC, flat out. And it was done very well that yeah. it hid that. So the thing is, can something be as stable, something like a TiVo, which has Linux underneath, can they do that? and do it successfully. Well, well here's, here's the biggest thing that both Steam and Apple have going for them, and they are attacking it from different ends of it. Rapid iteration, and it is easier and cheaper to develop for these platforms. It's expensive and lengthy to develop for a PlayStation, for an Xbox, for whatever both of those companies are going to come out with next, for Nintendo's Wii U. You can have a, you know, a, a small budget, a small team, make a gigantic hit game on either Steam or or Apple, and to port that and to say, hey, listen, now the living room's open to anybody who wants to make a great living room experience, either in the casual gaming way or, it, you know, Steam has a brand that is very much focused on a more immersive PC-style uh, game. This is, you know, it is the future, and that's where I think we're going to see the iteration or the innovation. Let's talk about Dropbox adding features to its web app over uh, the, the coming months. What's the story there, I ask? So there's a quick preview function that allows you to view a PDF, Doc, DocX, and PowerPoint files in a pop-up window. So that's the, the nice product, productivity side of it. The coolest feature is this new photo management that Dropbox will do. It'll take all the photos you have on throughout your Dropbox on any folder, not just your camera upload, and it will make them available in a single view. So it's not moving files. It's just giving you one place. It's a, it's a brand new view for this. From there, you can post these images to Twitter, Facebook, or email them. You can create shareable virtual albums. If you move a file, the virtual albums can still find the file. It's kind of like smart folders on, on Mac OS X, a whole bunch of these things. And Chris Beckman, the product manager for Dropbox, says he wants users to stop thinking of things as files, but as users' content. Tom, do you think with so many cloud services out there, do these moves differentiate Dropbox enough? I, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I think why is because Dropbox has been very clever about this. Remember, they were giving away free storage if you signed up to store your photos there. Uh, so a lot of people did that. And now suddenly they're saying, hey, we're going to give you some better ways to manage things. We're going to throw in some other. They're, they're, the phrase is boiling the frog uh, a lot of times is used, even though apparently that's based on a myth. Watch the Weird Things podcast if you want to <laughs> want more on that. Uh, but the idea that they're saying, look, we, you're relying on us for storage. We're not just going to stay doing that. We're going to give you better ways to manage this stuff. I think Dropbox is being pretty brilliant here. What do you think, Justin? This seems like really operating system style things. I mean, this I've seen this in OS X. I've seen this in Windows. They've decided to do a lot more. There's a lot more power when it comes to Dropbox to the point where you could just upload it in that one folder and you would have that same experience no matter where you went. Well, you know, we, we talked about tablets and, and, and how they, the, the inherent functionality of a lighter mobile uh, PC is something that a lot of people are attracted to. With Dropbox, 
where they've differentiated, differentiated themselves and continued to make themselves more and more attractive is for casual users to understand and interact with a storage service, which is very, you know, has a very enterprisey commodity kind of feel to it, even for big major uh, efforts like Google's Drive. You know, they're not exactly you know, user-friendly or or uh, intuitive to interact with it. Dropbox, every move Dropbox has made, including these, have been, hey, it's fun and easy to do this. Let me explain to you how this affects your life and makes your life better. And They're the Apple of cloud storage. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, they just bought Audio Galaxy. So, I mean, I would imagine they're going to be doing some interesting thing with music as well. If they can put this together, there's really no reason to be outside of Dropbox. Well, and it's like, because it is part of our lives. We all, you know, we everybody runs into the problem of uh, dragging a file into an email and then having it be like, oh, it's over the 25 megabyte limit to send this file. This is a way that people use these services that, you know, Dropbox is continuing to try to make it clear that, you know, this is what you can do with these sort of functionalities. All right, Jason, fire up the randomizer. Uh, Duncan Jones, you may know him from the movie Moon or perhaps Source Code with Jake Gyllenhaal, has been signed on to direct the on-again, off-again WoW movie. World of Warcraft movie is going to happen. Uh, they, they had Sam Raimi on for a while, then he left, then there was some question about whether it was going to happen, but there apparently is a script out there, and Duncan Jones has said... The question has always been, could somebody make a good movie based on a video game? Well, now I have to do it. Yes. Do yeah? Yeah, he can? I believe so, yeah. I I'm a huge Duncan Jones fan. I, I love Moon. I love Source Code. Uh, he was somebody that when Star Wars, when, when the new Star Wars movies were, were being talked about, that if they weren't going to get somebody like J.J. Abrams, who was obviously, you know, now tapped for it, and they wanted a young up-and-coming director who was really going to pour his heart and soul into it, I thought Duncan Jones would have been a great choice for that. So to look at where WoW is in terms of, of intellectual property uh, and, uh, you know, the, the mind share of people who really, really love that universe, I think you can absolutely make a great movie out of it. I mean, let, let's be clear here. There was a great movie made out of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. You can make a good movie out of literally anything. Uh, and there's no reason to think that he can't make a great uh, a great WoW feature film. Sarah, you're not a WoW player, uh, but I know you're a movie fan. Does does this interest you at all? Um, these these movies are always a little strange to me because it's like, well, how do you end it? But then maybe it's one of those things where it, then you get a sequel and then another one because it's it's an ongoing type of thing. I don't know. I, you're right. I'm not a WoW player. But I don't hate the idea of, you know, fantasy world movie. I, I like that sort of thing. I, I, I'd see it. I yeah. Mean, All right. I think that's a, that's, that's a positive right there. There were a ton of people who went to go see and loved Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit that didn't read Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. And w if you put it in front of them before those movies came out, would say, ew, no, gross. But they I, like for one, have never ridden Pirates of the Caribbean, but I have seen the movies. <laughs> have you never ridden Pirates of the Caribbean? I've never been to either Disney. What? This we'll is the that. most shocking element in tech news today history. <laughs> Somebody overlay the Inception sound over that revelation. <laughs> That's insane. The chat room's um, going crazy. We broke tech news today. Are you kidding me? No, it's a, a well-known fact in the tech news today audience, I, I, I think. I don't think so. There's shock and awe in the chat room right now. Pandemonium. People are tearing up chairs. It's pandemonium brings us back to the Warcraft movie. And uh, <laughs> I just wanted to mention that Charles Levitt... Is, uh, is signed on to write the script. He's the guy that brought, wrote Blood Diamond. Let's move on to the calendar. Hey, Stickham is closing down today. A lot of Twit fans will remember that uh, Stickham was one of the services that we used to use. Um, so RIP. Uh, the Windows 8 $40 upgrade deal that you may have heard about is actually ending today. So if you want to get in on it, today is the day. Speaking of Microsoft, it's launching the Surface Pro at Best Buy in New York on February 8th. Mark that on your calendars. And also looking ahead to September, September 17th to be exact, Grand Theft Auto V is coming out in September. So you've got something to look forward to this year. Ooh, I like, I, I, I like um, racing games. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto. Never mind. Let's see what's in there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, we got an email from, I don't know, CACC. He says, it was suggested on Tuesday's show that the Nook could be saved by making their books DRM-free. The Kobo has been DRM-free from the start, and the prices almost always match those of the iBook store and Barnes & Noble. I'm a Kindle reader myself. Most of my family use the Kobo, but with a simple tool like Calibre, I can convert to any format in uh, needed, including .mobi. DRM-free has, possi has possibly put the Kobo on top in certain markets, but based on how little you guys mention it, I doubt it has hit the U.S. market very hard. So DRM-free has not made them big. Why would it be any different for the Nook? Also, if Kobo can get away with DRM-free books from the same publishers as everyone else, why would Barnes & Noble not be able to? Well, I, I question whether Kobo has the entire catalog of books that Barnes & Noble and Amazon have because many publishers will not allow them to be sold without DRM. So I think Kobo ha has a good, a good selection of books, but if you dig into it, my guess would be you'd find that they don't have all the same titles. Uh, and But the other response I would have to this is, Kobo has a hard time getting people to pay attention because nobody knows what Kobo is. That's why it isn't catching on in the U.S. They're like, well, I know Kindle, and I definitely know what Barnes & Noble is, so I'm going to look at them first. So Barnes & Noble could succeed where Kobo doesn't simply on brand recognition. That's the advantage that they would have. Well, you know, uh, Kobo uh, was given a very good review by, uh, or one of the Kobo devices was given a very good review by Shannon Morse on the newest episode of Before You Buy. Uh, so go ahead. If you, if you are interested by this conversation, go ahead and check out that episode, and stay to hear some jerk review uh, a mobile charging power station. <laughs> Got another email from Christopher uh, listening to episode 679, so a couple of episodes ago, says, you're currently discussing pricing and platform alternatives to Microsoft's new Office 2013 and Office 365, as well as availability. You have forgotten one relatively unknown and quietly available option, Microsoft TechNet Professional. For $250 a year, you get access to not only Microsoft Office 2013 Professional Plus and every previous version of Office all the way back to 95, but every piece of Microsoft software back to DOS, uh, six point whatever, including Microsoft software for other platforms, includes Office 2011 for Mac. That should please Mac users. This is a great option for large families as users can can install basically anything that they want or need with multiple licenses. It's meant for IT shops and businesses for testing purposes, but I've been able to install the latest version of Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office all on my PCs in my house, and that is currently standing at six without encountering any licensing issues. That, that's a, a great tip for people to know. I know when Rafe Needleman tried to run this story uh, back in the CNET days a few years ago, Microsoft sort of said, hey, maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should just kind of uh, keep that quiet because uh, they would rather that the masses didn't catch on to that. It really is meant uh, for, for professionals, but it, it's still there and anybody can get it. So thanks for the email. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, before we go, breaking news, the Consumer Electronics Association has just put out a press release. Uh, two big pieces of news here. One, they have added Dishes Hopper as best of show at CES. If you recall, uh, CNET editors had named the Hopper Best of CES, and then at CBS's request, because CBS owns CNET, removed it and given it to the Razor Edge. Uh, the CEA has named Hopper as co-winner, so they haven't taken it away from the Razor Edge, but they have awarded it uh, to Dishes Hopper. And CEO Gary Shapiro's quote is, we are shocked that the Tiffany Network, another name for CBS, which is known for its high journalistic standards, would bar all its reporters from favorably describing classes of technology the network does not like. We believe that the Dish Hopper DVR is fully covered by the Supreme Court's ruling in Sony versus Universal City Studios. The simple fact is making television easier to watch is not against the law. It's simply pro-innovation and pro-consumer. And here's the other piece of news. Consumer Electronics Association also announced that it will soon issue a request for proposal to identify a new partner to run the Best of CES Awards program. So Consumer Electronics Association not only giving the hopper Best of CES, but taking the awards away from CNET. Wow. That is a big wrap on the knuckles uh, for, for CBS. You know, you have, you have to wonder with, with CNET that, uh, you know, when when Enron happened with Arthur Anderson, you there there were people who immediately knew that that was going to be kind of the beginning of the end for Arthur Anderson because, uh, as an accounting firm, you just can't do this. You are you are selling your service based on a reputation. And for CNET, you know, if you are a young journalist, I mean, do you want to go work for CNET, uh, having this uh, be a thing? And uh, you know, is it 
the best thing for those who are there now to think that they're not going to get overruled again. CEA says, we are concerned the new review policy will have a negative impact on our brand should we continue the awards relationship as currently constructed. We look forward to receiving new ideas to recognize the best of the best products introduced at the international CES. This is what I believed, and who am I? I don't, know, I don't matter, but this is what I believe should happen. So I, I, am, I, I agree with the CEA's decision here. But I'm sad for the people who work at CNET uh, because I think CBS does not realize how much they have damaged that brand. Absolutely. Well, what do you think? Tech news today. Yeah, you want to throw your hat in the ring? Take over the best of CES oh, awards? Man, do you know how much work that is? Hell no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> now, somebody like Engadget or the Next Web or The Verge, I, I think, are all well positioned uh, to bid on that, and, and I'm, I'm sure they will. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and somebody will probably take that over. All right. Well, that is it for this show. Justin Robert Young, thanks for joining us, man. Always good to have you along. Uh, what What do you want to tell folks about where they can find your stuff online? Uh, I get a new podcast. It's basically just me uh, ranting by myself. Uh, if you find that to be in any way an attractive proposition, you can head on over to jurytalks.com, J-U-R-Y-T-A-L-K-S.com. Otherwise, follow me on Twitter at Justin R. Young for all the deets. And you can find us at our subreddit if you want to submit stories for our consideration, technewstoday.reddit.com, the place to go to do that. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT and get links to our show notes and links to past episodes. A couple people this week have went and watched episode one for some reason. If you're one of those people, <laughs> uh, the hair never fell out on my arm. Watch the show, you'll understand. You can also email us, tnt at twit.tv and give us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Darren Kitchen and Stephen Johnson. See you then.